it is time for another Business Analysis Live. My name is Susan Moore. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at IIBA. And my name is Scott Bennett. I'm the Manager of Business Analysis here at the International Institute of Business Analysis. Susan, we've got a great topic lined up today. We're going to be talking about working across cultures. Hmm. You know, we, we've talked to a, a number of people around the globe around this particular topic. And I think this is going to be a great episode because of the guests we've got lined up. Very unique. Why don't you tell everyone about that? Yeah, we, you know, we work in an international association. In fact, Scott and I are uh, in different countries. And um, and so we wanted to introduce you to our account management staff who works first. They are all over the globe, but they work with our corporates, academics and endorsed education providers all over the world. So I cannot think of a better group of folks <laughs> to talk about the challenges and opportunities there are in working across cultures than our account managers. And so we'll have an opportunity to meet all six of them today. I think you're going to love them as much as we do and the insights they bring. Yeah, and this is really an important topic if you're working across cultures, because you can unknowingly make some mistakes that really you know, challenge your relationships. So our objective today is to empower you, give you some ideas of what to avoid, how to work across these cultures. So let's bring on our first guests here. They're in our same time zone, North America, okay. Leah and David. Yeah, that's right. Hi, everyone. Hello there. Hello. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yay, so Leah, we're happy to have you. Leah, you're in Canada, uh, serving um, Canada in northeastern us is that right northeastern and northwestern of this part period of time yes okay great and david tell us about the area that you cover sure uh, i'd love to scott so i work with our southeast area of the usa region uh and of course our latin america region so this includes the caribbean central and south america uh covering several chapters in that region as well that's great and, and, you know, David and I have something in common and, you know, we're an international organization, but it just so happens that David and I are located in the same town in North Carolina. Um, so that's kind of fun. Practically neighbors. <laughs> practically, in, in, by Charlotte, North Carolina standards, we are practically neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we're going to talk more with David and Leah about their perspectives on working across cultures. But because we have such a diverse group that we work with, we've got different time zones to take into account. So Susan and I spent some time doing some recordings with other account managers. So we're going to play that first so you can hear that conversation and, and what we're learning from those conversations. And then we'll loop back here with David and Leah so we can talk further about working across cultures. And before we start that video, we just want to remind you that even though that part is pre-recorded, we're still live and we want your questions today. So while you're hearing from them about their uh, their experiences working across cultures, add your comments in. And that is both LinkedIn and YouTube, which is a new thing we're doing today. That's right. All right. We're multi-streaming here. That's okay, right. So let's jump into the video and uh, we'll enjoy the conversation there. We want to welcome our first two folks from our uh, corporate sales team. We've got Andy Gracebrook. He is located in Europe, all of Europe. And then also Koketso Chaba. He is in the in Africa in Middle East region. And we affectionately refer to him as KK. So hello, Andy and KK. Hi, Susan. Hi, Scott. Yeah. Hey, hey, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Um, as we've talked about, uh, working across cultures can be a really challenging thing. And and both of you cover large regions. So love to hear your thoughts in terms of how you work with various people from different countries at, across different cultures. What are those things that you need to pay attention to as an IIB account manager when you're talking to different people? Yeah, maybe KK, you can start. Thanks, uh, Susan. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, so. I think the most important thing, right, uh, for us here in South Africa, one of the things that we refer to is Ubuntu, right? Ubuntu is a term which essentially means uh, I am because you are, right? For me to understand who you are, the first reference point is for me to listen, right? I would have to, okay. obviously, as I am speaking um, to you and as I'm trying to get to understand you better, the most important thing is for me to listen to you. 
what it is that you are as a human being before I can try to even maybe since I'm in the sales um, field before I can even try to even sell um, or even tell you more about who I am and the IBA is all about um, ask relevant questions in order to understand you as a human being so that I can even make it even more um, relatable when I'm actually um, speaking to you as well so for me um, that is the first um, reference point Ubuntu I am because you are, and for me to understand that, I need to listen to who you are as a human being so that I can communicate with you um, better. Hmm. That's wow. really beautiful. Yeah. 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 What do you think, Andy? Um, yeah, I think that's a really brilliant point and probably the most important <laughs> starting point um, with, with the whole thing, I suppose. From my perspective, you know, we very much do human jobs um so we're dealing generally with people all the time um in all of our interactions i think about our job as a, a job sort of managing and, and developing relationships with people and that needs to start from a point of understanding um who the person in front of you is and and what they're all about um as well as you know who they're representing in the organization as well but it always starts with the person um and i think that a lot of the time um you know, that also means in these multinational kind of coverages that we have, um, that we have to appreciate that, you know, there might be many different reasons why we shouldn't make assumptions about who is in front of us. You know, I'm based in London, but I'm talking to people in countries all around Europe. Um, there are many similarities, but I think that um, to, to assume what those might be can get you into a bit of a difficult space quite quickly and that it's better to listen first and let them tell you where, where they're coming from and, and who they are so that you can respond to things you have in common in response to what they're offering you. Um, so yeah, that's, that, those are the kind of uh, important things for me every day that I'm trying to <laughs> keep front of mind when talking to people, particularly people I haven't met before. Yeah. So it sounds like it's, it's important not to make assumptions that just because you're speaking to someone in, in a common language that they're similar to what you're celebrating or or, or the things that you value. Yeah, sure. Um, certainly not. And also not hopefully not too much based on appearance to let people tell you a little bit, because actually, um, you know, it's the modern world as well. So there's all kinds of uh, assumptions that would be out of date if we are out of date with our thinking and stuff like that. So I think that, um, again, it's, it's, it's really good to sort of let people off, offer it up to you. Uh, the language point, Scott's a really interesting one as well, I think. Um, I think both uh, Koketso and I speak uh, more than one language um, and, you know, that can be very useful and can help unlock um, situations where understanding is a bit more difficult if the other person happens to speak the language you're speaking, even if it's not their native one, you might have another option um, to engage. Um, but actually the, the understanding of language, I mean, I speak two languages well, but I, I understand more languages than that from growing up in Europe and stuff. Okay. Um, multi-language area but sometimes just knowing a few words in German and Spanish it helps me understand a little bit about those cultures as well but again it's always from how that's offered up and, and how people speak to me hopefully. Oh interesting and Kuketso how important is language to you in, in the work that you do? Um, yeah, language, uh, as Andy um, has just uh, stated, language is actually um, quite very important. I think, especially in the sense that um, if you are multilingual, right, um, you're able to obviously articulate, um, you might not be able to articulate yourself as perfectly, but being able to understand first and foremost, right, um, you can be able to contextualize um, the conversation um, from, you know, understanding those basic um, colloquial terms, um, for instance, right. Um, and I think the, the, the other important thing also is even with the language barriers, the one most important thing will, will actually be some, you know, the, 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 the body language. Right from that, you can also be able to then pick up where you know the the, the psyche of the person is, so that you can be able to also um, obviously get into a point where you 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 are communicating with the person um, in the right uh, frame of mind as well, um, because body, body language can also give a lot of um, things of over and above you know the the language. When there is that language barrier, the 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 the, the body language can also sort of help you to you know obviously say okay pause 
I think this person is trying to say this um, to me as well. Um, what that also teaches you is a bit of patience as well. Um, okay. Because what it'll, it'll, it'll do is with the difference in obviously the language barrier, um, you can be able to, you know, sort of, you know, hold yourself and try to understand the person. Right. What is this person trying to say to me? Um, yes, I might not be able to obviously, you know, speak to them in their uh, 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 home language, but I am able to at least see what they are trying to, to say to me. That, uh, again, I refer to the essence of Ubuntu, right? Um, the humanness of the person so that I can be able to communicate better. Yeah, I think what, what I'm hearing, just to kind of summarize what you both are saying is that one of the other traits that's necessary when working across cultures is the openness to learning. So there's the listening, but there's also the openness to learning and understanding uh, without judgment and without assumptions. So yeah, I think this has been really, really interesting. I'm so glad you guys could make time to <laughs> chat with us. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. And, and because we Cross cultures, um, happy holidays, uh, enjoy your winter festivities. Uh, we're all celebrating different things around the world at this point. So um, enjoy the holidays. And now we've got two more IIBA account managers who are on the other side of the world. We've got Suvarna Velazako and we've also got Xavier Traeger, uh, Xavier Traeger. <laughs> hey guys, how are you? Hi Susan, hi Todd. Hi Susan. Hi, Susan. Hi, Scott. Yeah, so, great Suvarna, to have you you're, you're covering the India Territory, and Xavier, you're covering Asia Pacific. So a very different area of the world than some of your colleagues that, that work in other areas. Um, tell us a little bit about, uh, we'll, we'll pick up uh, from our last conversation, how body language is important when working across cultures. Suvarna, you want to go first? Sure, sure. Uh, Yes, Scott. So uh, body language, I think a few aspects that immediately come to my mind when we speak of body language is how you greet when you meet somebody, uh, the distance you maintain when you sit with them or when you stand with them, mm -hmm. uh, some head nods and hand gestures that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, that we engage in while speaking and the posture generally. I think these are the immediate uh, points that come to my mind. And depending on the nature of the company that we are interacting with or, or the enterprise that we're interacting with, some of these things would vary. Like the hand, the, the shake hand is not, uh, typically in India, it's, it's not done all the time with everybody. Uh, and and uh, there is the namaste uh, hand gesture that all of you would be knowing of, but okay. that's that's not very common too. I mean, when we in a, in a company setting, that's not very common too. Uh, do the namaste. Uh, but yeah, yeah, things like these would immediately pop into my mind as uh, the important uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, I think dress code is also uh, one, one thing I would think of uh, and uh, how I dress when I visit a garment uh, organization versus how I dress uh, when I visit a, a more new age kind of organization would differ. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's... Wow, interesting. And And how do you know and learn uh, what's appropriate in what situation? Uh, I think I would do a little bit of research, but it also comes from experience because uh, typically uh, India, as such, I mean, you would all be knowing that India is very diverse. Uh, there are different states and each state speak speaks a different language. Uh, there's a lot of difference between the North Indian states and the South Indian states, the mm. West and the East Indian states. There's a lot of cultural differences. So. Growing up, uh, I mean, every metropolitan or cosmopolitan city would have a mix of people from different kinds of states. So I think growing up, we would know, essentially have some knowledge about uh, how people behave in uh, different settings. And uh, I think when we visit and when we speak to people, we get an idea of where they come from and then we know how to uh, engage in different kinds of gestures based on uh, how we interact. So I think there's a foundation uh, that everybody has when they start off. Wow. And okay. then uh, usually conversations get a little personal. Uh, so uh, I think the first thing we generally try to find out is where the person is from and try to strike a chord uh, with that information. Uh, so th that also helps in uh, getting that uh, setting right. Oh, very good. Xavier, you know, you have got a vast uh, territory in Asia and the Pacific Rim region. So Tell us what are some of the ways as you're working with folks all over that area, like how are you 
how are you figuring out how to work across all of these different cultures? Well, first of all, I've, um, I've got a bit, a bit of an atypical background. Um, my father was in the oil industry and I, I, was, I had an expat childhood. So I lived in uh, eight different countries until I was 14, uh, then spent 10 years in France. I'm half French from my father. And then now the past 11 years in Australia, uh, my, my mother's Australian. So I think I've had that kind of uh, fortunate up upbringing to be quite adaptable um, and, and have a, a various repertoire of, um, of, I don't know how to say, um, responses to different cultural situations. But um, I've used in the business setting very specific models uh, just to get sometimes an idea when I'm not familiar with a specific country or culture. There's a, a model called the Lewis model. It's a kind of a, a triangle diagram and there's gradient levels um, between uh, cultures or countries that may be more the linear type, multi-active type and what they call reactive type. And it's all around their, their warmth, um, we were talking about body language. There are those that have restrained body language, unrestrained body language, and often the South Asian, South Asian countries, more subtle body language types. There are things that are around results oriented or, or being a relationship oriented. So the, the Lewis model, I would recommend to have a look at it. It's um, always a bit dangerous to make um, assumptions and, and draw stereotypes. Um, it's important not to make those, those mistakes but there do seem to be some sort of national norms sometimes. So good to keep those under your belt as examples of models. And um, just generally speaking, be very um, curious, ask questions around culture, uh, be genuinely, uh, well, uh, open-minded. And again, be be very curious if as much as you can. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's something we heard from Andy and KK, right? Was sort of that idea of don't make assumptions. Um, that can be dangerous. So learning to, what what people are about and i like what you said Saverna, about um the personal conversations so getting to know people um again it's stepping away from that idea of making assumptions that can get you into trouble yeah that's and right sometimes business conversations aren't always about business they are about connecting with the people that you're working with on a human uh level uh, because that really can help to break down some of those barriers when you're working across cultures. Well, That's right. So I think Savarna had mentioned uh, previously that as in France, you would refer to somebody, at least in an email in France, dear sir, dear madam, and the surname. So I would refer to you all, uh, Ms. Moore, uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Velutical, but never by your first name. That's my experience 10 years in France. And when I came to Australia, and one of my emails, g'day Susan, g'day Scott. <laughs> Good day, right. yeah, it, yeah. Very I, I can relate to that too because uh, I think once uh, India opened up to the Western, I mean, country, I mean, companies coming from the West, multinational companies coming from different parts of the world, I think that's when the uh, idea of calling somebody by their first name originated or, or spread uh, across countries, I mean, companies in India. But otherwise, we would either say, sir, man, uh, based on their age as well. It's not just, I mean, there may be somebody who is not as senior uh, in, in terms of their hierarchy or title. And hierarchy is a big, uh, uh, you know, point as well when we have conversations. Uh, but then uh, if, if by age they are a little senior, then we would eventually, I mean, definitely call them uh, by sir or ma'am. So that's also a point that uh, I would keep in mind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you, Stavarna and Xavier, for recording the session with us and sharing some of your insights from where you live in the world. Um, we're coming up to some holiday time, so enjoy your break with your friends and family um, and have all the best for the season. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Scott. Have a great Bye. day. Thank you. All right. Well, listen, that was really fun. And you can tell that we were recording during the day and during the night <laughs> to, uh, to connect with our friends all over uh, the globe. There were some really interesting things that we were talking about. Leah, maybe what are some of the things that, that uh, are top of mind for you in thinking about working across cultures? So many of the points that my colleagues have made, you know, communication, listening, not assuming, these are all relevant points. And I try to add 
something, you know, I look at a situation and say, how would I want to be treated? What type of way would I want to interact with people? Um, it's identifying with them. And you'd be amazed what you can learn from people in the first five minutes of a conversation. It's that interactivity. It's not just a job. It's a, I want to know about you. Constantly learning. Uh, so I, I really think that these are key points as well. Uh, do on to others as you would have done to you is a big motto of mine. And at the same time, um, asking those questions, keeping that curiosity going, and then you can really identify and see that even though you're in a different part of the world, you have so many things in common. I'm first generation Canadian Italian. All of my ancestry is Italian. Learning three languages, interacting with different cultures, growing up in Montreal, all these experiences as well, uh, really build you to have that type of communication skill, I would say. What do you think, Dave? Yeah. And David, speaking of multiple languages, you also speak multiple languages and, and use that as part of the work that you do. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, my, my teammates have really stated things quite eloquently and uh, and I'm really proud to uh, to know them because they've shared and taught me so much. Uh, honestly, I do have to agree a lot with uh, KK's approach. I think there's a lot of similarities in terms of culture. I love how he described Ubuntu uh, in Latin America and in Spanish in general. There's a lot of that involved as well. We're a very dynamic language. And uh, in, in addition to listening, there's also a lot of a dynamic sense of building rapport in our cultures. So if you think about it, on top of understanding where the other person is coming from, now there's this back and forth, the dance, right, where we're trying to understand where you're at. What can we do? How can we fill a, a, a gap? Because ultimately, we're here having conversations, helping individuals and teams fill that gap. Right. And doing that in a different language also involves kind of molding your way of thinking to match the other person. So I think that's one of the benefits of a multilingual approach or having that kind of skill set. Uh, you're able to actually bridge more gaps, I'd say a little faster, but in a way, just more deeply. I think once you're more aware of different folks, different cultures, different upbringings, and of course, that's where everything my colleagues have mentioned really come into play. Uh, that experience, that back and forth, that application, right? Where we get to find a way to connect with people because that's essentially what we're trying to do. Whether we're connecting information or people, uh, we are trying to bridge gaps. Yeah, that's great to, to sort of understand that. And I'll just put a little bit of a plug in here, self-promotion. Um, IIBA has chapters that operate in different languages. Uh, David, right. you've been involved in one recently. Tell us about that. Yes, actually, uh, we are growing our chapter community in Latin America. And this involves Spanish speaking chapters that are making more inclusive of approaches to uh, different professionals. There is that language barrier involved. So having like-minded professionals who also speak the same language, uh, for example, in one of our newer chapters, Columbia, has led to huge, and I do mean uh, a huge interest in both corporate and academic communities. So we're having students, our next generation uh, of business analysis professionals really coming into uh, the fold in a way where they're learning from the potential of business analysis as a profession, right? The scope and, and future facing techniques that will make them successful in a wide variety of roles that go very much beyond a business analysis title. So I think it's really exciting. I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it. And, and it's really mirroring a pattern of growth that we would love to continue having uh, throughout the region as, as they're working hard, very hard as well. So this is a really uh, nice time uh, to be a Spanish speaking business analysis professional. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> yeah. and, and I'll add to that, that um, meeting people where they are with different languages is also part of what IIBA has been working on for several years now. So we also have multi-language um, materials. Um, I, Connor, put a link to those in the... <laughs> In the chat, please, um, so that so that we can share the languages that our materials are in, as well as some of our exams have also been translated. And hey, um, news alert: if you are someone who has um, language skills, we'll need your help in 2024 because we're expanding our um, our uh, multi-language materials, and we're looking for translators from the business analysis community. 
Yep, got a response from Connor. He says he's on it. Yeah, right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. <laughs> this is a live show, and we've had some comments come through, some really supportive comments, as well as some questions. So while we've got Leah and David here, uh, why don't we tackle some of those questions, Susan? Let's do that. And also, it's a reminder, because I see people are really connecting with this topic today, and we're live. So we're taking your questions. So if you've got a question, um, put that into our comments. So I think this one was just a, just kind of a me too, a thumbs up for um, Coquetso's active listening is the best form of respect. And I, this is absolutely true, right? We often think respect might come in the formality of terms or in different nonverbal body languages, but really one of the ways I think that you show respect is you, is you listen. Yeah. So thank you, Sadish, for that. Uh, then we have another comment here uh, from Suchita. Listening and understanding is the key to collaborate uh, to collaborate in effective communication. This usually allows you to stay away from assumptions. And I know that was a big part of um, really the, the conversation with KK and, and Andy. I don't know if you guys want to add anything else about avoiding assumptions about folks that you're working with. Any, any tips? things we want to share with the audience? I would say um, empathy. It's a strange way to look at it, but it's, it's having that empathetic listening skill where you're just wanting to hear more about them, letting them speak rather than being the person to speak. I think that there's a lot that can go really well with just letting people be, let them. You know? Yeah. 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 What do you think, David? Honestly, uh, I think this kind of thought process that was just mentioned is why many business analysis teams exist. Because we're in an age where we're trying to create business transformative services that essentially take out the assumptions from the picture. Because ex assumptions, as many of us are learning, can get really expensive especially when we have failed projects or, or difficulty in implementation, which we might have understood before if only we had a business analysis team to work with it. So uh, kind of understanding and having the pleasure of working uh, with different organizations with their BA teams uh, has helped me understand just how important avoiding assumptions are, right? And basic techniques like And at the heart of that. So I think that's a really good point. Uh, I think individuals and entire teams stand a lot to benefit from remembering that. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And uh, just a reminder that business analysis skills are life skills. So, so, and, you know, we often talk about the problems that assumptions can make in our projects. And so being aware that something is an assumption, how you address that, I think is a really important, you know, business analyst, we tend to make a, even whole sections of a document related to assumptions. So, um, Yes. So good and, reminder. And I'm going to quote you, Susan. You often say on this uh, broadcast that business analysis is a relationship business. And really, that's a, a, a tone that's resonating in all of our account managers is really understand the person and, and have that empathy, as Leah had mentioned. You know, I, I feel like sometimes uh, we, because we are so heads down in our projects, we often forget that we just need to relate to people as who they are, Ubuntu, right? We, we, and we really need to, to add more of that. And I know people say, oh my gosh, I've got to socialize. It's not really socializing. It's just meeting people where they are. It's, an, it's a really important part of the work that we do and getting to things like consensus or having difficult conversations. I mean, we've had so many guests this year, Scott, who have all said the same thing, right? If you, if you, if you want to have better stakeholder communication, you've got to do a little bit of this relationship work. So, um, and I think our, our account managers, they, that is in the realm where they exist as well. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Let's see. Next question here. Um, here we go. Here's one from Dwight. He is loving this conversation today. So what is a way you can breach a topic about an individual's background based on their name um, without sounding insensitive or stereotyping? And I feel like Andy kind of brought this up, too, in his conversation. What, what do you guys think? David, maybe you can start this one. 
Yeah, that is an awesome question. Um, I, I happen to be the guy that like happens to guess people's names or spelling right. But honestly, the secret to that is is just getting them to talk about it because who knows their background best? They do. So even something as simple as, hey, tell me a little bit about yourself or tell me a little bit about your history can actually start a conversation, right? Going back to that rapport building that fills in some of those blanks for you. So now you don't have to worry about being insensitive or stereotyping. As a matter of fact, now you're helping the person feel a little more comfortable and you're feeling more comfortable seeing that they're comfortable. And now the conversation is kind of developing more easily. So that's an awesome, awesome question. Just get them to speak about themselves, get them to tell uh, you a little bit about themselves if they seem a little bit like uh, uh, hesitant uh, or reticent about the topic, tell them a little bit about yourself first and then they'll be happy to reciprocate. So just a few ideas. Yep. What do you think, Leah? I, I totally agree with what David is saying there. And at the same time, um, it's kind of bizarre. A, a very simplistic way of thinking, I would say, is you didn't name yourself. Somebody else did, right? So tell me about you, the person. Uh, you can stereotype many people just based on a name and really we're all human. We all have our experiences. It's just tell me about you and, and where you come from and what you think about this. And then identifying with, with what they're saying in something about yourself. I have the gift of gab. I make fun of myself on a regular basis. So if I insert my foot in my mouth, I make that clear. This could possibly happen, but I will always respect you. Tell me about you. So. Uh -huh. Humor, yeah. Sometimes that can be a, a, a good way to, to start those conversations with a little bit of humor. All right, so we've got another question here. Uh, this one is coming from YouTube today, which we're so excited. Thanks for finding us all good on YouTube. So one of the things that all good is wondering is working across different time zones. I'm glad we got this question with different cultures. How do how do you do it? How do you manage all these time zones that we're in? Leah, I'll let you start this one. Well, what's good about IIBA and how we've expanded our group is to have account managers all across the globe. This helps to accommodate that. In, in times prior, uh, in early days, perhaps we would have had just some account managers working the entire globe, but we really personalized it to the effect where we have in Australia, we have in the US, we have in South Africa, Europe, you know, that facilitates it. And at the same time, when that is not available, it's basically tell me what time works best for you and understanding that this can set up a different time in your day. Yeah, this think? is, yeah. How about you, David? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm over here thinking about our directors. Uh, a term of endearment I have for him is is the New York Stock Exchange because he's got to be available for all of us. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Blake is not able to be with us today. Um, we miss you, Blake, if you're watching us. But yeah, he's on the. He is literally on the clock, twenty four seven. Yeah, but uh, but at, at my level, what I get to enjoy doing is uh, first getting to know different areas. So I will uh, kind of get to know my time zones in a time zone format. I will ask them, hey, what times work best for you? Uh, and it's not just, you know, uh, platitudes or convenience. I'm also noting, OK, folks around this area are available during this time of day. What I essentially try and do is collate that data and try and plan my day around that. So if I know if uh, folks say, for example, in Brazil that are uh, two hours ahead of me have a specific day of the week or specific time of the day where it works out better for them, then I meet them halfway, kind of go into a uh, format where I have this time of day uh, set out for them. Or for example, uh, areas like Mexico. In Western Mexico, uh, we've got folks that are two, almost three hours behind me. So the same thing. So as I get more data, I try and uh, kind of block out different times so that I can focus on folks there as well. And uh, it helps a lot uh, because then your brain is kind of staying on one topic in one group as well as uh, one language, which I personally benefit from. So that's uh, that's probably one of the easiest ways to uh, kind of manage the time. Just block out areas depending on what feedback you're getting from those areas themselves. 
Yeah, one thing that I've done in my calendar, because we do walk, work across time zones, all staff, um, is I've got Mountain and Pacific time set up in my calendar. So my own local time zone, Eastern, I can see those other two. And then when I'm booking a meeting with someone, I recognize, oh, they're in whatever time and it shows me real time uh, what time zone it is for them. So you might have a tool that can help with a little bit of that as well. Yeah, my, my tool is World Time Buddy, so um, so I don't we're not getting paid for that, but it's a it's an excellent tool because you can line up different time zones. But I think much like we, <clears throat> so what I'm hearing you guys say is much like uh, how we need to be aware of the individual, kind of have a relationship with them. We also need to kind of have a relationship with the time zones that we work in, and that means having an awareness of them, putting them in the in the front of our mind so that we can understand, um, you know, what time is it to so-and-so that I'm working with? I think that just makes uh, our service to them much more personal when we can be thinking about their time zone. It's a way that we show respect. And even just asking, we come across a lot of people that we're dealing with them via telephone, but also via email. And sometimes that scheduling tool this is how my calendar is set up. It's Eastern time. Tell me about you. What are you set up as? Asking those questions right off the bat, you get to be able to avoid that kind of obstacle if if you're not paying that attention. You know, I'm I'm thinking about all of what's been said here. And, and the thing that I'm left with is that we have to make effort to be more transparent about a lot of things in order to work across cultures, whether it's understanding, you know, formality, understanding the person, understanding the the area they're from, the time zone they're in, um, where we can, you know, maybe assume some things. We really have to make an effort to say those things out loud. Use your, your question skills, your interview skills in order to do that. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think that's really what maybe working across cultures is uh, is all about. Um, so I think that's it. We're kind of at the end of our questions for today. I don't know if there's anything else, any wrap up you want to do, Scott? Well, we do have a really interesting business analysis live session, a little self-promotion for next time. <laughs> Susan will tell you about that in a minute. But I want to say uh, happy holidays to uh, Leah and David. Thank you for joining us and sharing your experience in, in what you do. Um, it's uh, it's definitely, I think, helpful just based on the comments that we're seeing live right now. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Leah. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah, so great to have you. Thanks for being with us today. And let me tell you what we're going to talk about the next time. It'll be in the new year, January 3rd. We're going to talk about the best of business analysis live. So if you're just finding us for the first time on YouTube, we've been doing this for a while. This one will be a great one you'll want to tune in to to see what we've been talking about. And hey, you know that thing they say where what happens in Las Vegas stays in Vegas? Well, We've got a special video from Las Vegas that we're going to show you. You won't believe it. So we can't wait to see you then. Two weeks from today, happy holidays. Mm -hmm.